the UK, broadcasting around the world. Around the world. You're listening to the Mike Drop Club, hosted by Douglas Hammond Diche. Message received. Message received. You do not need to know what you need. What you need. Just engage with the podcast feed. Just engage with the podcast feed. Providing weekly insights into cool stuff we've read, saw, did, or heard about what made us say, wow, eureka, damn, nothing is off limits. If it motivates and inspires you to reach your goals, then it shall be discussed. Featuring guest interviews from high performers and people of influence and weekly awards for the best mic drop moment. This podcast is guaranteed to leave you pumped up for the week ahead. Don't just live life, make life boom. Podcast that we've done in around health took you on a journey whereby we were looking at the why are we digitizing and why is it important in terms of trans- transforming services. And Ian led on a conversation around ICU noise, the noise of the beeping machines that you hear in the background. And we just want to wrap this up, bring this all back home into addressing patient safety. Because at the end of the day, we could do all of these things. But if we do not um, bring, a, um, bring to the market or support a culture whereby software in software or medical devices in around the use in a hospital, care setting do not meet dcb0129 or dcb0160 these are the standards for um clinical risk management we are doing a disservice and potentially doing harm to our patients so ian how are you doing welcome thank you very much douglas i'm doing well i'm doing well i'm very pleased to be back for the the third installment so um let's let's try and close on a good one yeah yeah i don't think it's a closure as such i think this is just a trinity <laughs> this is just yeah, like a it's trinity. a good it's a good subject <laughs> it's um you know as you say patient safety needs to be at the core of everything that we do and yeah. always need to bring your focus back to that um and it's you know it's i think it's why we're in this game isn't it is yeah. to, to make patients safer so uh, I'm really pleased to talk about this. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Because as we are now unifying, um, there's a convergence taking place. It's been going on for the last 10 years, I would say. But it's really come to the fore now where health and social care are emerging into one. It's important mm. that we um, continue the hard work that has been done in terms of bringing around quality and patient safety standards and ensuring as health moves into a, a, a single entity that potentially could be just care. We do yeah. not lose some of those practices and principles in around patient safety and clinical um, risk management of systems, because again, the reach now is different. There's a blurring, particularly around the medical device guidance that we're getting now, particularly as we're exiting out of, um, uh, now we're out of Europe as, as it were, we're still maintaining some of the standards anyway in around patient mm. safety and the CE mark as well. So that also fits into what we're going to be discussing here. If you're a software company and you're delivering a solution in the care environment, the health and social care environment, there are implications for you in order for you to um, be able to um, sell into that market or add some value into the market. And that is all about how you wrap your product around this clinical safety um, management suite of um, regulatory tools and um, statutory bodies. You have to make sure that you are, are adhering to all of these principles. So just for your background, um, Ian, how, how do you view clinical safety in terms of the organizations that, that you work for? So, I'm very keen to kind of embed the concept of patient safety, what we do, what we can achieve with our uh, technology in the whole culture of the business. So whenever I talk to, you know, I do um, presentations to wider uh, members of our teams um, in the business to, you know, fill them in on interesting projects that we're doing. So we're doing a massive digital transformation project, um, at the moment, 
which is has huge far reaching implications. And a lot of the business, they, they kind of hear about it. They hear about the order value and, and the size of the deal, but they don't really know what it is. So I, I, I can I do presentations to the, the wider team, the, the admin support, the finance team, people like that to explain to them what the projects are. And I'm really, really keen to always drive it back to the point of really fundamentally what we're, what we're about is, you know, reducing risk, reducing mortality, reducing morbidity and, and, you know, boil it down to the salient point, which is that if we do our job right, more people will live, you know, and, that's a really powerful point for people to start understanding people in the business to know that whilst they may not be on the front line of, of, of a project like that, whilst they may not have been involved in uh, the sales process or, or even the direct delivery process, they need to understand that the organization that they are supporting with their daily jobs is fundamentally doing that. That's what we're about because one, it's a big responsibility. And people should be aware of the, that responsibility that we're not making widgets that, you know, make your beer taste better or something like that. What we're doing is we're, we're impacting clinical safety. And if we do it wrong, we can give harm. But if we do it right, then we improve. And secondly, you know, for me personally, it's a huge driver to do my job well and to get out of bed in the morning because it's something that I think everybody should be proud of in our business. Exactly. I, I totally agree with you on that one. As a clinical safety officer as well, it is the risks that we hold are massive and huge. And sometimes I feel they're not fully uh, respected. When a clinician yeah. signs off a piece of software as being clinically safe, they're putting their registration on the line. And yeah. that could be um, four, four or five years worth of education coupled by maybe 10 years worth of practice or even more. They're putting that on the line on the basis that the company has followed the due process to ensuring to the best of their ability, all risks have been mitigated. Some yeah. risks you can never get rid of. There's always going to be some regi <clears throat> residual risk, but the premise should be this. Your system, your solution should not increase yeah. the risk of somebody um, receiving care, whether yeah. that's a clinician or a patient, you know, um, who obviously delivers the care. So in that being said, we do understand that when we always introduce new technology, there's that dip whereby people have to understand how to use the software. And in yeah. that dip process, you could introduce risks, but it should still not be more than the risk before you rolled out the solution and certainly not after post, post implementation. And this is what I find sometimes alarming when, when you speak to fellow clinicians and when I wear my clinical hat on and there's, there's, they're speaking in a very negative way around the solution that they're using and clinicians, nurses, um, doctors, consultants, we can vote with our feet. If we feel a solution is not enabling us to deliver care effectively and safely, we don't really have to use it yeah. because we, we have to justify ourselves to professional bodies such as GMC, NMC. Um, this is why you find in some environments, there's still due processes taking place, you know, yeah. whereby a nurse patient facing will still um, maintain paper-based records of some yep. some sort of notation because either A, they don't trust an electronic version or it's not really meeting the needs. So clinical safety is one I've seen grow with the standards DCB0129, but I've seen it also add a little bit of confusion in in the way, in, in, in its remit, in around health and social care. Because again, if you work in social care, you're not working with patients. Mm. You work in individuals, you work in yeah, citizens. Exactly, yeah. And somehow I think that it's, it's time for a refreshing of some of the language that's used in, in, in those standards and also just ensure that it can it has a bit more breadth to it in terms of what we can do in terms of managing risk. So I'm from the generation, right? And I'm not saying this to 
offend anyone that drives a Volvo. I'm not. I drive a Volvo, by the way. <laughs> do you? Just so you know. I do. Do, do you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Fantastic. No. Car. No. <laughs> it's, it's all right. It's all right. I'm not. I mean, what I'm trying to get get by that is this: Volvos are essentially very safe cars. Yeah. Mm. Am I right to yeah. say you bought the car primarily because it's, it will kept you and your family safe? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's my point. It is. It was designed for safety in mind, right? Yeah. Now, when you now when new software companies are developing software, the the primary one of the primary drivers is how can we make this slicker? How can we make this you know um, more pleasing on the eye, etc., 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 so that we can entice people to use the products when yeah. they when they need to take a look at the fundamentals and get the patient safety elements yeah. correct because Volvo not only do you build um safe cars but over the years if you go back to the 80s I'm old yeah. enough to show you the 80s you know and the Volvo car was literally you could draw it a kid would draw it like as, brick. Yeah. As, exactly as four bricks <laughs> yeah. one brick two bricks one one brick yeah that's how yeah. it was now the cars are slicker mm. and it still retained its safety aspect to it yeah, 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 and it's got the, uh, and that's still always the reputation of the Volvo is the safety. You know, they're very nice cars now, and uh, you know, I mean, I've done eighty thousand miles in mine. It still feels brand new. It's a lovely car to drive. Yeah, but of course, yeah, the point of why I got it was I just had my little boy, uh, you know, and it was all about safety. It was about a car that I could feel comfortable with him in the back. Yeah, you know, so. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, it's, it's about what is the hook that's going to get your, your product to market, your software, your application, your hardware, whatever it is that you're putting into a healthcare environment. I do think, you know, marketing and, 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 uh, product design often looks for the wrong hook Uh, and in healthcare, primarily it should be safety and whether that safety as an incidental thing in, in terms of, because we're going to make your life easier, you know, Mrs. Consultant, Mr. Nurse, whatever, because we're going to make your life easier and and relieve some stress that fundamentally leads to patient safety, or it could be some technology that is, is fundamentally improving visibility of what's going on with the patient, which of course increases safety. But the drawback should always be, it's making your patients safer. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, this is why there's a lot of resistance to technology, um, to digital change in, in healthcare. If people talk about nurses are very resistant to change, nurses are people. They're not resistant to change any more than anybody else is. But the reason you get such resistance from nurses is because nurses are dealing with the patient all day, whether it's a group of patients or an individual patient dependent on the level of care. They're dealing with those patients. They're the front line. They're face to face with their patients. And they are fundamentally the, the, the person who is there to safeguard the patient. That's their primary objective is keep that patient safe. And if you introduce something to the nurse and they don't believe that it is reducing the risk of harm to that patient or worse, if they believe that it's introducing a risk of harm, then they're just going to say, no, I'm not doing it because it's not about just being resistant to change for the sake of change. It's about saying, I will not introduce additional risk to my patients. So come up with something that reduces that risk. Excellent point. Excellent point. And I just want to pick up on the word believable. And that is something that is really under, underplayed in health. How much clinicians rely on belief. Yeah. You know, we, we not only do we have to believe the patient can get better, and instill that belief in the patient at a, at a time when by they might not believe they can get better. Yeah. That also transcends onto the, the instruments that we use. This is why a lot of doctors still walk around with stethoscopes around their necks. Not only is it yeah. a symbol of, of status and the role, it's quickly, quickly identify a doctor because they've got a stethoscope around their, around their neck. It's also because they can rely on it. They believe yeah. in their yeah. ability that when they use the apparatus, they're going to get the correct reading. So believability is something that clinicians really take seriously. I don't see a lot of that in tech marketing 
literature mm. that to enable um, patients, on um, clinicians, sorry, to believe, to have that trust in the software, on the hardware, or in the apparatus that they're using, that that is going to be their go-to. You know, because yeah. when things go mm. wrong, and so, unfortunately within health, sometimes this is this is this can be um, the norm at times. It is the, the clinician that has to break the news to the loved one, to the carer, yeah. why something didn't work. So believability is something that um, is important. And how do we measure believability? As if you're a software company believing <coughs> delivering a software that that you think is clinically safe, that you've gone through the, the unnecessary um, standards. How do you then impart that? Having the standards is one thing. It's, it's, you could consider it a tick box exercise. But to make sure that the service who are buying your products believe that you're actually sincere, you've got to demonstrate that how you're embedding clinical safety throughout all your processes. Yeah. For example, um, when you do sprint meetings, when you're, mm. when you're developing the software, do you discuss clinical safety issues? Are they discussed yeah. then? Because preventive prevention is better than the cure, right? Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So are, are people there already in tune with their role? Or has this already been documented effectively in a hazard log? And you're actually trying to remedy them out before they even go to market? Or are we collating rem are collecting hazards that are high level hazards that are that will be on every single software's hazard log? And I, mm. and, and I do see this. I think we need to be bolder and be able to really start to be expansive in our thought process into what do we consider as risks and then yeah. try to mitigate them out as cleanly and, and as effectively and as transparently as possible with our, with our customers. Yeah, and I, I think you're, you're absolutely right in terms of it needs to be cultural. That's what healthcare organizations want to see from health tech companies is that their culture is about the same goal as they have, which is to keep patient patients safe, to make, get them better quicker, to free up space and time in, in the hospital environment or in the, the, the social care environment or anywhere really where, where care is being delivered. But they want to see that that tech company has that culture and that their goal is the same. And that's provable in the way that you engage with projects. And it, you know, it goes back to our first conversation. Mm -hmm. If you engage correctly at the start, if you show that your culture is all about the things that are important to them and you say, look, it's not going to be an easy project because of this, that, and the other, and it's not necessarily a cheap product because we've built in all of this stuff because we've looked at things like, you know, even the importance of how long it takes for a screen to open load times of a, of a screen, how long does it take from first login to access the patient record and how do we mitigate that? And, and these things add complexity and they add cost. but what it shows then is that we have considered that even at your peak operating capacity, even with all of your beds full, even with every user trying to access the system at the same time, the way we have built it will mean that you get a couple of seconds and you're into the record. Even though we know you're not going to need that 99% of the time, because that 1% of the time when you do need it, you've got to know that it's going to work. Yes, It has to work every time because the first time it doesn't work, that's the last time they'll use it. Excellent point. Excellent point. And again, back to the project plan. How many project plans have you seen in your career where clinical safety between a software company and an NHS organization are having conversations and it's, and it's documented in a project plan on conception, on kickoff, mm. you know, and, and at key milestones before you even deploy. Yeah. You know, too few, I would say. Too, yeah, exactly. Few. Too few. <laughs> and um, I think the resistance comes from two places. One from the software company believing wrongfully that if they address clinical safety, they will build something that they, that they do not want to build because they have in their head mm. the solution as they see it. What I will say to, to that is, to counter that, I will say, look, if you look at the motor industry, and Volvo was an excellent example, there's a lot of innovation Volvo brought into the motor industry that's now standard now that improves yeah. the driving experience. Yeah? 
I'm not yeah. too sure if they invented ABS <clears throat> brakes. It might have come from Formula One. I'm not too sure. But certainly the crumple zones where you yeah. know if you were to have a side on, front on, rear collision. Yeah. 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 You in the middle are safe. Yeah. And ultimately, we go to work as clinicians to deliver safe care and to protect our registration. So yes. there is something about introducing clinical safety right at the beginning and having these two parties. If you're a clinical safety officer for a trust, which is all well and good, and a clinical safety officer for a um, software company, they should have a relationship. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, clinical safety is, it can be the driver. It doesn't mean you have to get there the same way. Okay. The clinician is going to have a view on clinical safety and the software developer is going to have a view on clinical safety. Hmm. Now those won't necessarily at the start be the same. The, 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 the resistance to the, the technology may be that, there's a there's a worry around patient safety or what happens if I'm trying to access the application and another application is overlaying it or something like that, you know, whatever. It's up to the software company, the tech company, to understand the clinical environment, to understand the risks and the needs and the desires, and then to be able to elucidate that to the buyers to the, to the clinical teams to say, I have thought about clinical safety and I understand your worry is X, Y, Z. I can help you mitigate that, but we do it in this way. And it's, it's about being able to show that you've considered that you understood that risk and you may not have got to the same conclusion, but you have developed something that mitigates that risk. Correct. Correct. And, and that's the point because that's what will give them the confidence. If you can, if you can, if you can take them on that journey and they get it at the end and they go, okay, all right, that's not the way I would have gone, but now I see it. And if the risk is mitigated, it doesn't matter about the route. Exactly. Exactly. And, and back to the relationship part, if your clinical <clears throat> safety officers have a trusting relationship with each other from yeah. the private sector um, software company to the NHS trust, that helps when you do have a, a difference in how you classify risk. And as yeah. you quite rightly said, there's many instances that I, when I was a clinician on the wards, I would classify risk completely different to how a software company would rate or flag the risk. So you've got these differences on so, um, the rating of a risk. But yeah. only, through, only through development of a trusting relationship can you get to some sort of broad consensus as to, okay, fine. If we put in these measures, we can reduce the risk to being classified as a three or two or one, whichever way you, whichever way you're using your risk matrix. Okay. And yeah. that there is so, so important because too often, because there's no relationship between clinical safety officer on, on either side, only when something's gone wrong, do they really meet? Yeah. Then you have issues and in the project, either being delayed on um, rolled back <laughs> or even sometimes yeah. um, not even um, proceeding. So it's important, I would say, look look at your project plans, really engage clinical safety officers on both sides as early as possible. And they should help you with your iterations because you should yeah. iterate becoming safer and safer. Look at Formula One. You might, yeah. some people might argue that the speeds are not getting that much faster. So the technology is there to make cars go even phenomenally mm. more faster, but can oh, they yeah, do it yeah. in a safe way? No, it's not because people would die. So they've got yeah. safety measures that they put in every place every year, you know, to ensure the drivers remain safe and the, people, the spectators and the work crew and all that are safe to enjoy the spectacle of Formula One racing. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's interesting. So I'm a huge fan of Formula One. I've been watching it, you know, since I was, since I was tiny. And I mean, even, even when I was growing up, you had, drivers dying every year. Yeah. Um, now that was in the eighties. Uh, and, and now <laughs> thankfully it's, it's incredibly rare, but you, you see the reaction to certain things. So, you know, when, uh, um, John Surtis' son died a few years back because a tire from another car hit him in the head, you know, wheel came off another car and hit him and, and he died, which was terrible. And immediately a whole bunch of new safety measures were introduced. They tightened up the tire, the, the wheel tethers, so that if a wheel came off, it was still 
attached to the car by mm. like a really strong tether. And then they also introduced the halo around yeah. the top. So you still in open cockpits, but now you have this, this halo. And there was a lot of resistance to that. Everyone's like, oh, like, you know, the drivers won't be able to see properly. The fans won't like it, blah, blah, blah. You know, they hammered it through because they said, it, it's just too brisky. Okay. The tethers don't always work. There's massive collisions. You know, a wheel can always come loose. And if it hits a driver, that's it. So sorry, you might not like it. We're doing it anyway. I don't see anyone complaining now. Exactly. I still watch it. Yep. I think it's great. Yep. And it's nice to know that, you know, you're, you're watching it and these guys aren't risking their lives the way they used to. I don't know if you've seen the film Rush with, uh, you know, about James Hunt and Nicky Lauda. Yes, I did. Yeah, uh, I saw that. That was the, the guy who acted as Thor, right? Huh? The guy who acted yeah, as... Chris, Chris Hemsworth, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you have to excuse that's my That's a ignorance. great movie. Yeah, I love it. It's, it shows, I mean, it just highlights that, that was 1976. They were, that was in that movie. So that's not that long ago. And two drivers a year were dying. We saw that it, it, it's just not acceptable no, for entertainment, not. for that much risk to be in, in, involved. So if, if you take that approach on formula one, you've got to take an even stricter, stronger approach to care because you can't introduce risk. No, and, can't. Uh, and and I, I I love what you're saying there about clinical safety officers on both sides being involved from day one and building a strong relationship. And this is what we're seeing with, with, with the complex projects that we're working on at the moment is we've got teams of people on both sides that have mirrored roles and they're working so closely together from day one. Uh, and, and, one of the interesting things is that you start to see, even before the contract is signed, you start to see things like, okay, so we look at the penalties they're putting into the service level agreement um, about, you know, downtime and things like that. And they're huge. And their explanation is, well, it's because, you know, this is a critical system and it's about patient safety. We can't have the system go down. So therefore we're, we're giving, we're introducing a really big stick Mm-hmm. If you guys, so, so that you guys know the importance of, of making it secure and keeping the uptime. And we turn around and say, that's absolutely fine. We're completely on board with that. So, you know, for us to reach this uptime, this is how we have to build the system. Now that doesn't fit with your current budget, but mm-hmm. it does fit with your requirement. Yes. And then you have a frank and open conversation about it. And, and yeah, you go with, the higher budget piece because it's a critical requirement because patient safety is key, but they understand why we're where we are on price yeah. and they understand why the system has been, let's say over spec'd. It hasn't. It's just the requirement specification was under. Yeah. It wouldn't deliver what they needed for the high availability. And that's, you know, there's, there's no bitterness, no antagonism. You're having an open conversation. You're saying we'll meet your SLA we will we'll accept those penalties because we don't expect to fail, but why not? Because we've built it like this and that means it's pretty expensive. Yeah. A, a, a good point. I was also going to ask you about um, retrospectively signing mm-hmm. off clinical applications, which, which is, tends to happen now. A lot of software companies have already built out tech, built out solutions, never had clinical safety high on the agenda. They, although they will say, that they mm. were adhering to processes and standards, but didn't go for accreditation at all. And yeah. then a clinical safety officer has to go in and potentially, quote unquote, sign off features that were done way before their time. Mm. What's, your, what's your view on that? Well, look, it's risky, isn't it? And again, it, it comes back to the issue of if you, if you introduce a person to the process late on, then that person's attitude is going to be colored by that. Either they're, they're going to be annoyed that they weren't involved in the process earlier and, and therefore they take a, a very strict view mm. on anything that they can pull out as being um, wrong or they're not invested in it, in which case they can be a bit, let's say fair about how they approach the solution. But either way, what you, what you can see is, is the potential for under or over classification rather than 
a really objective view of is this safe? Yes. Is this introducing any risk? Is this mitigating risk? Is this reducing risk? Uh, and I don't think that's a sensible way of doing it. I think, you know, fundamentally, if you're building technology in healthcare, you should have that view all the way from the beginning, from the, exactly. the blueprint, the drawing board to the live steady state deployment of a product all the way through that there has to be the checks and the balances and the view on is there anything in what we're doing that is introducing risk and if so what do we do to mitigate that yeah yeah because again um, the risks are as you articulate are huge and they are real and they're present we've seen trust yeah. now potentially being um put up for corporate manslaughter when yeah. patients die and it's only until um, coroners and people do investigations really start to distill and drill right down as to what was the primary cause of death or harm to yeah. a patient. Typically what's been happening, if you look on the NMC registration, you see a lot of nurses, a lot of nurses, a lot of clinicians, you know, skilled professionals um, up before tribunal for poor care yeah. And they're stipulating that it's down to software. Yeah. They're, they're, and then the software company will say, no, we've got evidence to support the fact that, no, you would have seen that record. You saw it. We've got yeah. alert that you should have seen it. So this feeds into our global discussion around why digitization is so, so important, that transparency and doing it for the right reason is so, so important. Because when you do have natural design, natural way of building software, you can put in place things that clinicians can see. You know, yeah. no point having an, an alert that nobody sees, but it's yeah. there. But if it's not built in a way that's natural, I always say to tell the story, I was in the trendy um, nightclub um, toilet in Mayfair, and I went to the women's toilet. I went in there and I got so far into the women's toilet, <laughs> only when yeah. I heard the gasps, I realised I was a women's <laughs> toilet. I came out embarrassed and I couldn't even find the men's toilet. I was so annoyed because it was these new trendy toilets. Yeah. yeah. That yeah, yeah the yeah. symbol is not male, female. The symbol is, I don't know what it is. It's look as looks Aztec to me, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I don't know what I'm, what I'm doing. If you have that sort of design methodology to, yeah. to, with a view to be slicker in your software at point of use, if a Christian doesn't know or believe that that's going to give them the right outcome, yeah. Mm. You're introducing patient safety risks there. Yeah. And this, this comes back to something, I guess you, you and I have talked about before, which is the difference between change and transformation. Right. And, and, you know, if you introduce a digitized health record into, let's say an ICU, um, that's currently run on paper and all you do is you lift up every single process that's done on paper and you create a digital form and you put it into computers. That's not transformation. You know, yeah, it's a change yeah, because people are interacting via a, a PC, you know, um, or even tablets and things like that. But it's not transformation. And, and actually, it can introduce more risk because you've got all these kind of really easy checklists on the paper forms that say, uh, you know, have you done X, Y, and Z with the patient on your daily care plans? Have you uh, checked their nutrition? Have you administered any, any prescribed antibiotics? Mm -hmm. Have you checked for pressure ulcers? All those kinds of things. Um, and those on paper is just tick, 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 tick. But you, when you start to introduce those things onto uh, a digital form and you start to mandate the input of information, you know, you can have mandatory boxes on paper, but you can ignore them. Paper is really easy as an input device because whilst it tells you what, you, what it wants, you can put anything. Yeah. You can leave boxes that are mandatory and come back and fill them in later. Uh, you can't do that with digital forms. So what it ends up with is, is people get frustrated and they don't want to use it. And so they don't complete the form at all while they're doing the action with the patient. They'll do it later because they need five, 10 minutes to do it. And that's pointless because what digital systems give you the opportunity to do is get rid of some of that process. You can automate things, right? So why have a checklist that says, have you administered any prescribed antibiotics for every single patient and every single daily care plan? 
when you've got a digital system that creates a task list when an antibiotic has been prescribed, points it up on the nurse's to-do list, tells the nurse when it's due, alarms if it's overdue, and automatically records the completion of the task yeah. when the nurse does it. So, you, you know, you're, you're reducing risk in that way because you are guaranteeing that the information is there and it's alerted and it's cascaded and it's monitored and it's captured at the time of use. Correct. Correct. And it goes how do you approach? How do you approach? Do you, yeah. do you just digitize or do you say, well, let's transform? And it goes back to it's what you were saying. Change. Yeah, it's a change. And it goes back to what you were saying about um, giving clinicians back their time. Transformation mm. always works on the premise that you also take a look at the capabilities of the people who are going to be using that, that device, that thing. You're looking to transform that service, that whatever it is. And too often that we're not looking at the capabilities of the people that we're looking to transform the services. I'll give it yeah. another, another example of that is... Um, if you look, if you call your GP surgery now, these are surgeries that are now digitized to digitize the process. So, so they say, yet mm. you have to call five minutes to nine to book an appointment. So fine, you book your appointment. Um, you arrive at the doctor's surgery. Um, you, you might use a console, type in your credentials, name and address, yep. or whatever is name. And then it tells you on a board when your name's been called out, and you can go in but nothing has changed that's no different from you going into a doctor's surgery now and speaking to the um the administrator the the, the clerk whatever it is say i've arrived mm. blah, blah. it's no different to having that process or having your name being called out yeah. on the machine you're still sitting there you don't know how long it's going to take for you to be seen by your doctor yeah. you're still in an environment that's going to be potentially full of bacteria and germs anyway so there's a potential yeah. of you going in there without having a, a problem and inheriting a problem just by sitting in the waiting room. You know, yeah. so these yeah. are things, yeah. these, these, these are changes because it doesn't look at the capability of the individual to manage their own time. Because if it yeah. were, the, there should be a system whereby you don't, you only come into the surgery when your name, when you're about to be seen. So you're mitigating yeah. the time in the environment. Yeah. And a lot of it, you know, I mean, or even you're doing a lot of it via video consultation. Exactly. It can be exactly. much better because, of course, you don't ever then go into the environment where the germs are spreading. And this is the point. I mean, like, so I think one of the best ways I've heard it put the difference between change and transformation was that change fixes the problems of the past and transformation creates the future. Right. So yeah. the problems of the past that you're talking about that have been changed at the GP surgery were a queue of people standing at the reception desk and the receptionist having to check people in manually. They come in, they give their name and the receptionist marks them mm -hmm. on the system as arrived. And so instead of doing that, you go to a self check-in terminal and you just type in some details and it automatically marks you on the system as arrived. It's, it fixes our, our problem, but it doesn't create a different future. Mm. Whereas the application of, of things like video consultation, the, the, the use of wearable medical devices that can gather clinical parameters and transmit, transmit that information remotely to your GP so that they can see your parameters at the same time as talking to you on a video consultation. You know, even things like little blood glucose tests and stuff that you can do at home that they can talk you through. These kinds of things are available and that's transformation because that means that you keep a whole bunch of people, vulnerable people, away from other sick people. You have much more information because you can have a whole set of clinical parameters that be measured over days rather than just take your blood pressure and your temperature when you walk into the GP exactly. surgery. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. And your GPs can see more patients. There you go. Yeah. And that, that's so, what this is all about. This is, this is the why we're in, in this space because we are trying to bring about that future state whereby people yeah. are safer um, and are transformed. And based upon their own capabilities, there's a lot a patient can do. They're experts mm. in their own illness because they live, yeah. they've got their lived experience. How can we then marry that with the technology, with the clinical input? And that, that's where you get the three-part um, scenario, whereby when all those three elements are acknowledged and are built upon, you get the best health outcomes. Because at the end of the yeah. day, we're not trying to fix a patient per se. 
for them to be broken in the community and come back again. We want to want to enable them to stay well yeah. and um, look after themselves because they should be the best um, treatment. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, completely. And that, and it's about extending that that wing of care yes. away from just clinical environments to the home environment because then you keep people healthier. You help them improve to a better state than they would have. And you prevent, you know, a, a lot of the serious conditions that, that come about because people don't, don't want to bother their GP. We're always hearing every single day how busy GPs are, how underfunded they are, how few of them we've got. And so you get a lot of patients who, who, who wait until they're very, very unwell before they go and see the doctor. And at that point, you know, it, it can be so much harder, so much more expensive to treat this patient than it would have been. And the outcomes will inevitably be worse. Whereas we have the technology to completely transform this. To, you know, you, you get uh, a lot of patients have things like white coat hypertension. Whenever they go and see the, the doctor, their blood pressure's through the roof because they don't like seeing the doctor. They're scared. That's me. You know? <laughs> right, exactly. It's well known. Yeah, because it's, it's, well you know, known. <laughs> it's it, it, it can be intimidating. And what you get then is, is useless data. If every time the doctor measures your blood pressure, it's through the roof and they go, well, you've got hypertension, yeah. you know, here's some, here's some beta blockers. Yeah. But if you measured it constantly or, you know, enough data points when they're at home, when they're just chilling out and there's nothing, nothing wrong. And you go, okay, actually the trend generally is, is quite a normal blood pressure. It's just when they come and see me, it's going through yes. the roof. So actually <laughs> that's, that's not a physical issue, no. right? That's neurological or psychological. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have to laugh because that's so, so true. And then you see it all the time. A needle approaches the patient, you know, blood pressure goes through the roof if they're scared of needles. You, yeah. The, the, the list is endless for those, for those things. I just want to say as, as we're wrapping this up that um, this, this three part series has, has been fascinating. And we've taken people on a, on a, on a journey through digital, um, Take a look at your pet hates in terms of the noise in IC, ICU yeah. units. And I want people to also to reflect on that next time they're in the hospital and ask themselves, are some of those noises really in the background necessary? And what are they mm. actually used for? And, all, or, and also patient safety. And around patient safety, I want to say, if you are a, a hospital trust and you had two buy-in applications of equal capability, one mm. of them had um was like the Volvo of tech, yeah? Mm. And the other one was um what what are these cars that crash or the or unreliable? Yeah. Mm. Lada. A Lada. A Lada. Which one would you have? Or should I say um a, a flashy Porsche a high perform, performance car but prone to breaking down. Would you yeah. go for the Volvo or we go to the high performance car that's prone to breaking down? I I'd take the Volvo. I'll take the Volvo. <laughs> and I can say Every- that because I used to have an Alfa Romeo, which broke all the time. It yeah. was a lovely car. And now I've got a Volvo and it's never broken down in my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My uncle got a Maserati and it breaks down all the time. Lovely yeah. breaks down all the time. But again, what is this all about? We're here to not just look at the, the flashy, shiny pieces of tech mm. the fundamentals have to be in place we need to be thinking around yeah. the volvo um, methodology in terms of bringing safety to the front and fore of what we are delivering look on websites for different companies and software and see how much do they articulate the patient safety journey how much yeah. do they openly share how much they are testing their their software in the clinical environment I'm um, testing it and those lessons learned for the testing are feeding the iterations because they discuss yeah. it in um, sprint meeting, planning meetings, all of those things. So it's constantly evolving with the mindset, with the view of keeping clinic clinicians and most importantly, patients safe. And that's what it's yeah. about. Yeah, exactly. And I, look, I think it's always possible to polish something, to make it look nicer, to make it look slicker. It's far harder to take something that is really slick looking, but functionally not sound and re-engineer it to, to be 
better. And, and you know, it comes back to it. Hey guys, everybody ready? Atomic mic drop. Mic drop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I that look one. awful, right? Yeah. But they were reliable and they were safe. And now they look great. But they're still reliable and they're still safe. And you know, we've got a we've got a piece of software for, for critical care, which I've always uh, I, I've never really liked the look of the UI that much. Mm. You know, it, it doesn't look great, but it works really well, and it's come from a place of, of patient safety and, and true consideration about what it means to be digital. And the, 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 the doctors that I talk to they don't care what it looks like. They care how it works yes. and how it supports them. And at the end of the day, yeah, we're, we're working on the UI and we're making a much better, much nicer front end because the back end's already there and the excellent. front end's not difficult. It's window dressing. That's a, such an excellent point. And, and, and I'm so proud of myself <laughs> <laughs> for mentioning the Volvo because that is what it's that's about. That's an analogy that's gone through this whole conversation. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is because you will not look at a Volvo again the same way after this after this, this podcast. You just can't. Yeah, but that's yeah. what it's about. One company is open and transparent with, with safety at mind. Yeah, and yeah. have continued to iterate, making the car slicker, sexier, all of that yeah. kind of stuff. So you cannot even tell. Some, there's some tech in a Volvo. That is far more superior than in its counterparts like the BMW, such as the Audis, that only mm. in a Volvo. Yeah. That's what it's about. Opposed to getting yeah. something that's really slick and sexy and then trying to reverse engineer it <laughs> to be exactly. safe. Exactly. And it's it's even more than that. It's about <laughs> the inherent culture of yeah. where it came from. That's the thing. The inherent culture of where it came from, because everybody just knows Volvo equals safe. Yes. Volvo equals safe. And if safety is a concern, if you've got a young family, it often is, you know, first time you're going driving with a kid, because you used to be, you know, like a young lad driving around like a nutcase didn't care. Yeah. Now you're a family man yeah. and you, you're driving around with a baby in the car. The only thing I was thinking about was safety. Yeah. I was not interested in anything else. And it's exactly the same when approaching technology and healthcare. You know, I, I think you talk to the nurses, you talk to, patient safety leads, you talk to clinicians and you say, okay, out of a bunch of things, how it looks, how fast it is, how slick it is, the name of it mm -hmm. or patient safety, user interface, all these things, rank these in order. Patient safety will come first 100%. because there's so many mortality and morbidity reviews now. Yeah, We have become increasingly litigious in this country. Um, some would say that's a good thing. Some would say that's a bad thing. I think it's important that healthcare organizations are held to account, you know, and they should be. And when mistakes happen, they need to be addressed. I think it's, you know, the ambulance chases that you see uh, advertising all over the place are not good for anybody, but mm -hmm. maybe their shareholders, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, the, the, the litigation is there now and these mortality and morb morbidity reviews are becoming more and more common and clinicians want to be able to stand there and say, I did everything I could. The stuff that I'm using worked. Unfortunately, this patient didn't make it or unfortunately some harm came to this patient, but it's not because something broke and it's not because we did a bad job. It just happens sometimes. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And, so, and, and, and um, it's important for all of us to really digest that because yeah, yeah. every, I think we lose probably two stadium for, of people, you know, per year. That's over 80,000 yeah. people who have died from medical errors, you know, in the, in the yeah. UK. And that, that's, that's a figure that's, you know, it's, it's frightening. We don't need to do that. You know, yeah. clinicians don't spend their time training, continually studying to harm their patients. So as you said, yeah. Ian, we should not be introducing yeah. risks when, when, yeah. where, whereby they have tried their utmost to preserve life. That's what they're doing. Then we, exactly. we're coming and, in the cook. They need what we put in their hands. They need it to work every time, first time. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and if you do that, if you do that, if you approach this business with that culture, they can read it in you when you talk to them. They understand and they go, okay, this person cares about what I care about, which is the safety of my patients and the sanity of my staff. 
And so they're approaching it in the right way and then they'll listen. Sure, sure. And a bit of future gazing before we close. Why this is important? Because as we know, the future is moving to more robotic um, operations, <clears throat> management of care and AI. If you're yep. coming from a culture whereby your culture is not patient centric, patient safety is not really considered, what sort of algorithm are you developing? You know, and what are the implications mm. to harming patients with your algorithm? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and, and that's a worry, isn't it? I mean, AI, AI has such massive potential and I'm really, really interested to see where it goes. But you're absolutely right. If you're approaching it just on the basis of a data analyst um, and how to manipulate big data, then it is worrying where those algorithms could go because they're not so predictable necessarily. Mm. It's, it's not like creating, you know, uh, a mechanical device, which just does what it, it does. You know, once you've built it, it functions in a certain way and it doesn't function in a different way. You know, these, these cognitive computing, these learning algorithms can, can change and develop over time. And, uh, it, <laughs> fundamentally it has to be that starting point of how can I improve safety? And, 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 and it's doable with AI seeing it with, um, imaging results, you know, how AI algorithms are able to spot cancers and, and uh, other conditions with a, a, at least as much accuracy as the leading yes. consultants in those fields. And they will get better. And that's come from a good place and it's come from the right place. Exactly. Um, I worry about some of the others maybe. <laughs> So no, thank you very, thank you very much, Ian. Um, it's been a pleasure this Trinity, um, yeah. of, of podcast. I, I really have enjoyed. It. I've learned a lot from you. Um, Pleasure's been all mine. Uh, oh, fantastic! And you know, I'll be thinking, scheming of ways that we can collaborate further in the future. So you guys, listen out for future collaborations. Um, Ian, have a fantastic week and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you very much. You too. Take care, guys. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out micdropclub.com and get the show notes and useful links. Subscribe to the podcast. Don't just live life, make life boom. Hey, Dan, Yeah, good. <laughs> As always, going off on a tangent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we do, though, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no fixed path here, is there? No, no, no and they shouldn't be, and they, and they shouldn't be. I don't see the mm. value in. Why is this so blurry? I was I had my son here the other day, and, and he's messed around with my camera settings. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I enjoyed that. Um, yeah, me too. Man, yeah, me too. I enjoyed That's that. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, I think that the whole thing with the Volvo thing worked. Yeah, no, it was a great analogy to come up with, to be honest. Um, because, like I say, I mean, the fact that I've got one as well is uh, it, it's quite it, it's close to home. Because you know that's the point. People make these decisions, and it's we we need a, a vehicle to to get that point across. Yeah, it's quite clear and easy, and I think that works really well. No, no, that's good. That's good. So I will think of something else that we can work on I'm, I'm thinking of um the quite the quite a few bits and pieces i'm trying to i have a conversation with certain people um in around the media stuff i'm doing as well so i'll, I'll give you cool. a, a call during the week because there might be quite a couple of things that i want you i would like you to or invite you to consider yeah um moving forward um because it's getting traction i think the, yeah. the, the style of communication is better you know, it, it, we, I think we need to shake up some of the health space. You know, the usual faces are the ones that do all the talks and mm. you know, I think there's a, there's a numbing effect as it were. Yeah, it's, it's just fatigue, isn't it? You know, um, hearing the same voices all the time. And I think, you know, like, you know, what I find refreshing is that you, you, you and I, we both approach this from the same space, which is that we fundamentally, we care yeah. right, about doing this right. And we care about getting that message out there that, that people, people should understand that people who work in health tech are not all in it for the money. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of money in health tech, a lot of money spent on it, 
But what people need to understand is that a lot of us approach it, you know, as almost as a calling, you know, as a vocation, not just a paycheck. And, uh, and it's good to get that message out. It makes me, makes me very happy that you've given me this voice to do that. So I really appreciate no, it. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm on it. And we, that book is coming. That book yeah. is coming. Uh, uh, it has to come. I think if we, um, we sit down and, and really craft something, we can do something around a book. Yeah. You are so much more. MikeDropClub.com Make life boom.